All right, well, we'll make this a little interactive. So, you all, right now, work for a large healthcare company based in Europe. You've got hospitals and medical practices all over Europe. In fact, you personally have been responsible for starting the newest, most sophisticated hospital here in the UK. It's been an amazing project. You've got an enormous amount of credibility, both for your company and for yourself personally. And in fact, you've been asked to lead the acquisition of your largest competitor. You've had some initial meetings. It couldn't be going better. The only problem is this morning hasn't gone well. You see, you got a visit from GCHQ, and they had a little sit down with you. And um, they wanted to talk about some data that they found tangled up in another investigation. You see, it looks like there's a bunch of patient records, in fact, a few million patient records, maybe even some royal healthcare records, combined with your corporate email and uh, some other documents, some financial documents that are all tangled up in this other investigation, and it looks like they're all posted out on the dark web. Your team, you got them together this morning, you went out and looked at it, and unfortunately it is your data. You've been breached. Now my question for anybody in the audience, what do you do now? What's your first move? I'm gonna call on somebody if somebody doesn't raise their hand and give me an answer. Who do you call? What's your first move? move. You'd move? Okay, well that's probably, you'd run? <laughs> we see a lot of that. Anyone else, anyone know who to call? CSO. CSO, what's their number? Do you know the phone number? You're gonna dial 999 and say, hey, I've been the victim of a cyber breach, send some fire trucks? Come on, who here knows who to call? All right, this is exactly the point that I wanna articulate. And one of the challenges that we've been dealing with. Anybody know why I'm showing a 72 hour clock? GDPR. You've got 72 hours, because guess what? It's just been confirmed you've been breached. So you have 72 hours to disclose this to regulators. Now, what do you think you're gonna know in 72 hours? Probably not a whole lot, right? You're gonna start your investigation. You don't know how real this is. You don't know where this is coming from, but you are now on the clock. And the challenge that we're dealing with is take a look at a lot of the recent breaches, right? We're finding breaches that, oh, well, they found out about it in February of March of last year. You know, a typical breach could be three months, six months from the time the company knew about it until they disclosed if they were even required to. And now all that's going to get compressed to 72 hours. Now, it isn't like breach disclosure laws don't exist. Um, I live in the United States. There's 47 different breach disclosure laws, but none of them really have any teeth. This one has some teeth. Anyone remember what the ramifications are? 20 million euro, a 4% of last year's revenue, whichever number is larger. So you think you're going to pay attention to the 72 hour number? I think so. So what are we going to do about this? Well, my name's Caleb Barlow, and my team and I set out on an interesting journey about a year ago, and we built this. This is the world's first at scale cyber simulation environment, and it's fully immersive. And what you see here, these are actual shots from inside the range. This is a full on watch floor, just like you'd see in one of our security operations centers. It has about 40 operator consoles, nearly a petabyte of live load that we can load into the environment, and it's a live fire range. Now, we're not shooting bullets, but we are shooting live malware, various attacks, DDoS attacks, and we can take down a fictitious company that we built. Now, the interesting thing about this is when we built this, we thought all the time we would spend would be hands-on keyboard with technical operators. Man, we could not have been more wrong. We spend just as much time working with people on how to respond to the crisis situation, the management situation of what they've now got going on in a breach. Now, anyone want to guess which groups do the best in this range? Women. Women? <laughs> well, unfortunately, in the cybersecurity industry, there's only about 10% women, which is a huge problem that we need to address. So unfortunately, it's not women because there's not enough of you yet. But we need to work on that. Anyone else want to guess? Well, anyone want to guess who does the worst? Let's try that. C-suite, you're close. People with an MBA. <laughs> now, I got to say this at Harvard University a few weeks ago, and it was kind of fun, uh, in their business school. Now, why is that? We have taught people in business school to think slow and deliberately, to make decisions with data. 
When you don't have enough data, go build consensus. Build that PowerPoint. In fact, I was on a recent real breach where we go into the company, we have the call to tell them how bad things are. It's a nation state attacker that was on their network, and this was all real. We get on the call, and the first thing that strikes me is the CISO and the CEO and the CIO don't show up to the call. It's a little odd, considering the magnitude of what we're talking about. But then again, we're the vendor, so not unheard of. We go through the process, we explain what they need to do, and you know what the response was we got? Hey, this is great. Can you put it into a PowerPoint for us? <laughs> and I'm sitting there with my team, like, oh, excuse me? I'm like, why do you need a PowerPoint? I'm like, oh, we need to go and tell the CISO and the CEO and the CISO and the CIO. I'm like, oh, well, look, we don't really have time. How about, you know, I just join you again for that call and we'll walk through it all over again? I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to do this today. We have the big staff meeting on Thursdays. We'll bring it into the staff meeting on Thursday. You know, now this isn't an issue of malfeasance. This is an issue of incompetence. This is an issue of people not understanding the urgency that you're under and the need to respond and be on mission when something like a cyber breach occurs. So let me introduce you. Oh, let me ask you one other thing. So we didn't cover who does well. People with military experience. And the other group, oddly enough, is people with emergency medical experience. Now, why do these two groups do well? Anyone want to guess? They're the two careers that practice and rehearse and simulate what they do over and over and over again, right? If you think about someone in the military, they practice fighting a whole lot more than they actually fight. And that discipline also of being able to make decisions with limited data and be comfortable doing that and comfortable questioning your own decisions is critical during a breach. So let me introduce you to a new concept that we call left and right of boom. So this timeline outlines a, a typical breach. And you know the dynamics of a breach could vary. But you notice in the middle is what we call the boom event. Now, this isn't a bomb going off, or a blast, or a, a gun being fired. In this case, this is the breach breaking into the major media. Because once the breach breaks it into the media, then we lose control over the core partition's message. So everything left of boom, so left on this chart, is about trying to protect, defend, and stop the attack. Everything right of boom is about dealing with the aftermath. Now, we found that although companies have spent a lot of time and money focusing on left of boom, they're completely incompetent right of boom. And this is something we never expected to discover, but we see it every day happening in this cyber simulator. And we've been really thinking about how do we train people to deal with this? How do we think of this in new ways? And what I'd also impart on you is that when your company is breached, this isn't just a technical issue. So you all have 72 hours to figure out what you're going to do. But this is also a financial issue. So this is a recent breach, less than a month ago. And this is a large, publicly traded European company. And you notice, when the breach becomes public, within a matter of an hour, the stock drops off the cliff. Now, you have now two crises. You have a technical crisis of figuring out your breach and how you're going to deal with it. But you also now have a financial crisis. So this is bringing in lots of other people. Now, what's also interesting, Who's this? Seriously, who is that? We are now in the realm where, this is, by the way, this isn't some individual. This is an institutional investor of some magnitude moving some serious money here, right? So we are now in the era where hedge funds and institutional investors are looking at this. You know, here's Equifax, same sort of thing. Literally, and I don't know how well you can see this, but I mean, this goes off here and just drops off a cliff. And of course, you know, since then, it's only gotten worse. But my point to you is that as a team, you have to be thinking about all the aspects of your response, what you're going to say, what you're going to do. And I don't think we have to look any further than what's happened over the last few weeks to realize that you need to demonstrate leadership in during a breach that you have the right response teams, that you've got the right practices in place, that you're doing the right thing. Because if you don't, if it looks like you're trying to hide something, if it looks like you're trying to trade on it, then it's not going to play well in the court of public opinion. And ultimately, it's not going to play well for you financially. I would argue that if we look at most major breaches over the last four or five years, the response to the major breach is causing more damage than the breach did itself. And that is something we can all completely avoid. Now, Let's take a look at another, let's talk about what best practice looks like. So one of the other great things about the range is people show up 
and they bring their best practices. And we're seeing some amazing things that people are doing. So first of all, we see lots of people building run books. And sometimes they pull them out of their pocket. So when I ask questions like I did earlier, like what number you're going to call, they've got them on the back of their badge, or they pull the run book out of their pocket. Because guess what? Oftentimes during a major breach, one of the first things that happens is you lose your email and you lose primary communications. So is your team, do they know what to do? Do they know how to respond? We're seeing concepts like Agile that you'd see in development and daily scrums moving into the SOC, where you're scrumming daily on the newest threats and how you want to respond. Obviously, the human factor is always a challenge. One of my favorite examples is a chaos process, where a particular company, they infuse chaos into their security team every day. So think of it this way. You're not waiting for the bad guys to take down a server. You do it yourself in production every day. 25% of this company's security team's time is dedicated to events they create themselves. Now, you want to talk about a resilient team? Drop a data center, drop a server. They know exactly how to deal with it because they do it every day. Now, that's a team that can handle a breach. You know, increasing the cost for the bad guys. Remember, 80% of what we deal with is not nation states. 80% of what we deal with is organized crime. If we change the economics for the bad guys, do we make cybercrime not pay? So coming up with ways to increase the cost. Now, my favorite of them all is this one, these two pictures here. This guy shows up at the range. His team does very well. And uh, he says at the end, he goes, oh, you got to check out my work truck. I brought it with me. I'm like, your work truck? You're a CISO. What do you have a work truck for? He's like, oh, well, one of the big concerns we have, now this is a company that moves lots of money. And his biggest concern is if he loses primary communications, they have large transaction-based systems. They need to know to start processing in another location. So he needs ground truth within an hour. Well, his concern is if he loses communications, how is he going to get that ground truth? He has five of these vehicles deployed throughout the country, outside of his, all of his data centers. They have all of their run books in printed binders. They have a series of computers and satellite uplink connections so that when one hour, one of these trucks can move into position and he can get details on what's actually going on. Now, that's the extreme, but I want to give you a picture of what good looks like and what some people are thinking about right of boom in terms of how they respond. Now, if we look at another great example of this, now, Maersk, as many of you know, is impacted by NotPetya. And I'm not here to talk about their security posture before the breach, but I do want to talk about how they responded right of boom, because this is really exceptional. The first thing that happened within an hour or so is their corporate website, which you kind of see on the top of the page, changed to this, right on the front page. Intimate details of what's going on and what they know right now. On Twitter, every few minutes, they were posting details of what they know, what their status of their systems was. And what's fascinating about this is they were demonstrating something we call the commander's intent. Despite everything else that was going on, they were focusing on three primary things, in my belief. One, the protection of life and safety of their employees and their customers. Because remember, this is a company that moves global trade. They have lots of ships and ports. There's bad things that could happen. Second protection of their data, and third, protection of their brand. So you see this going out. Now, the backstory here, they had lost all primary communications. Their email systems were completely down. They were communicating between executives using social media and WhatsApp in texting trees. Executives texting managers, managers texting subordinates, and a simple message relayed out from the CEO, and this is it here. Do what you would think is right to serve the customer, do not wait for headquarters. We will accept the cost. That is an astounding message for a CEO to deliver. And I encourage you, all of you to think to yourselves, could your CEO stand up and do that within an hour or two of realizing that you potentially were under attack? What does that do? It pushes authority from the organizational structure down into an incident command structure at the lowest level. It empowers people to make decisions and empowers people to do what's right. It's an excellent example of operating well right of boom. Now, in contrast, there are other companies, this is during, I believe, WannaCry, where employees didn't know that it probably wasn't appropriate to be posting about the attack on social media. So this is kind of the message you get from this particular company. Um, probably not the best way you want to be relaying to you, the public. All network servers are down. Do not turn on your computers. Please remove all laptops from docking stations and keep them turned off, no exceptions. 
Um, in Ukraine, this is what we saw at a supermarket. And of course, these are the things being tweeted out. But this is how your brand is being perceived. Now, if you were an institutional trader, if you're an investor, if you're a customer of these companies, are you going to have a different perception of the leadership when you compare what I showed you, for example, in the mayor's example, versus these? This is all about operating right of boom with authority and with direction. So are you ready? Because we've only got 71 hours and 15 minutes. So really think about if this situation was yours, would you be able to react and respond in time? Thank you. Thank you.